Okay, so it's been about a month since we recorded a video about some of the wildflowers here uh, in Story County in Iowa. So our first one today that we're going to take a look at is a pretty common one that you usually see around your neighborhood as an ornamental or around some parks or things like that. Uh, this is Eastern Redbud. Uh, it is a member of the bean family. So if you take a close look at some of these flowers, um, you can see that they are pea-shaped. Uh, these are the same kind of shape of flowers that you'll see uh, for peas, for clovers, um, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's a very interesting plant. It fixes nitrogen just like any other legume might. Um, it's uh, one of those plants that flowers before it actually leaves. So you can see on some of these, uh, some of these branches, uh, you can see a lot of flowers and really not a lot of leaves until you get to the very tips. Um, then you'll start to see some new leaf growth. Uh, other than that, it's really just a big kind of bundle of flowers on most of the branches until you get to some of them that have started le uh, producing leaves uh, while their flowers have died off. Um, so this is one of the edible uh, trees here in Iowa, so you can eat uh, pretty much most of it. Uh, I probably wouldn't eat the leaves because they probably won't taste very good, uh, but the flowers are edible. Uh, the seeds are edible. The seed pods, I believe, are edible. Um, but uh, very interesting plant and very good for landscaping. So um, one of those really cool uh, natives that we like to promote. Uh, very, very pretty, very pink, uh, really helps promote pollinators here in the early part of the year. So um, if you're interested in putting a new tree uh, and you want some color, I would definitely recommend uh, the Eastern Redbud. So we are now here at a recently partially burned area of Moore Memorial Park. Um, one of the issues that they did try to solve with this burning or attempted to solve was an invasion of uh, riverbank grape or wild grape. Uh, here in the uh, more sandy side of the prairie. Um, so you can see some of these grape leaves just kind of sticking up uh, all over the place. Um, the burn, I don't think, did a really tremendous job of getting rid of some of the stuff, but you can see that there's a lot of grape shoots all over the place. Um, something else that we might want to take a look into for controlling this um, is the classic of just eating it. Um, grape leaves, grapes, uh, regardless of if they're native or wild, um, all delicious, all uh, pretty nutritious, and you can even make a wine out of it. So um, keep an eye out for some flowers that start showing up with these, uh, with these grape plants, um, and keep an eye out for actual fruits. Um, they're just as good as any other grape. Uh, they might be a little more sour than what you're used to, but... Um, as long as you avoid the seeds, they should be pretty good. Um, but uh, these are vines, so they will be trailing all along the prairie, and it might choke out some of the underbrush. Uh, so this is something that might need to be controlled soon. Um, so I'll keep you updated if we, uh, if we find a solution. Um, but maybe we're in for another burning next year. Um, lots and lots of grape leaves, as you can see, kind of all over the place, just kind of sticking up. Um, so... Maybe a new burn for next year, um, maybe a little later in the season to kind of cut this thing down, but um, kind of interesting. You don't see a lot of grape invasions here in a prairie. Um, so, yeah. So here's another issue that's going on in this uh, sandy prairie. Um, lots of garlic mustard. Now, garlic mustard is incredibly invasive, uh, brought over from the old world, so Europe uh, and Asia and the Middle East. Um, in North Africa, but um, it's uh, it was used over there as one of the earliest forms of spices. Uh, as the name implies, uh, garlic mustard is in the mustard family, uh, or the cabbage family, brassicaceae, um, but it also has the very distinctive taste and smell of garlic, um, which makes it a pretty unique spice and salad food. Um, now you can eat this uh, as you control it, um, so if you pick it, you can take off the younger leaves uh, and use those in either a salad or a pesto or something like that. Uh, I have some in my freezer that I used for a pesto, which was okay. Um, I kind of just wish I had basil instead, uh, but it's pretty garlicky, pretty okay tasting. Um, I'm not really selling this very well, but uh, some people like it more than I do. 
Uh, I'm just not a big fan of uh, mustards in general, so maybe that's just on me. Um, but you can tell this out or tell this apart from other plants in the area from uh, its heart shave, heart shaped uh, serrated leaves um, and its white flowers. And those white flowers will have four petals. That's kind of a standard for uh, mustards. Um, four petals kind of tells it apart from all the other uh, plant families uh, except for, uh, I guess, evening primroses. But uh, pretty widespread invasion here, especially underneath this tree. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I think it's a some sort of locust, but um, really, really bad invasion. And this kind of continues on throughout this part of the prairie, um, and then the uh, woodside. Uh, as I go down more, if I find some fully blooming ones, I'll I'll refilm and uh, add it to this one. But really, really bad invasion. And this is a widespread throughout Iowa. So this isn't just a more Memorial Park issue. This is a central Iowa issue, a statewide issue, and then a region-wide issue. So you'll see this a lot um, all throughout the central U.S. and even the eastern U.S. So a uh, really, uh, really bad plant to have in your area. And really the only effective way of getting rid of it is by pulling it. So... Um, it's easy in sandy sites like this to come out pretty easy, but they have some pretty deep and nasty and gnarly roots. So uh, you'll want to really get pulling um, if, you're, uh, if you're bored one day and want to help restore an area. Um, but that's uh, unfortunate here in this uh, the sandy site. Uh, sandy sites are usually pretty rare around central Iowa. So um, hopefully they'll, uh, they'll take a lesson from what they... Uh, how they burned this year, um, and maybe kind of uh, move it pa move it back a little bit for next year um, and reburn. But unfortunate. But if you're willing to do a good deed, uh, they can always use help with uh, picking this garlic mustard out, and you might get some fresh produce. So um, it is what it is. Uh, this isn't unique, but uh, it's just unfortunate. So like what I was saying before. Uh, here is the garlic mustard up close. So there's one back there. Here's one that's fully blooming right now. It's about to set to seed. Um, so I'll go ahead and pull it after I talk about it. Uh, so here's garlic mustard. Uh, you can tell that it is garlic mustard because it has distinctive mustard flowers for petals. They are white and it has those heart-shaped uh, serrated pointy leaves. Um, you can also tell because it has those mustard uh, kind of tentacle looking things up on top. I believe those go to seed eventually. Um, but those are really, uh, really definitive of all the cabbages and mustards and that type of stuff. Um, but it is, uh, it's bad. Um, this is one, uh, just one large plant among hundreds here in the site. So, um, if you see something that looks like this, pull it, um, before you pull it, you can crush the leaves between your, uh, you can pull off a leaf and uh, crush it between your fingers and smell it. If it smells like garlic, it's garlic mustard. Get rid of it. Um, it's bad. So uh, if you see it in any of your local parks or you see it around, uh, pull it. It's not supposed to be here. It's super invasive. Um, leaving it just causes more problems down the road. So um, yeah, here's some just some up close shots of garlic mustard. Again, leaves are edible. I'm not a big fan, but other people swear by it. Um, put it in a salad, make a pesto out of it. Tastes like a mixture of uh, maybe turnip greens or mustard greens and, of course, garlic. So, yeah, uh, if you see this, get rid of it. So this is awesome. This is really good. I'm really glad I found it. Uh, this is choke cherry. This is a very, very, very important indigenous plant. Uh, and has been used uh, by indigenous people by uh, for hundreds and thousands and tons of years. It is a really, really cool plant. Um, so as the name suggests, it choke cherry. It's in the cherry family, um, or the rose family. Uh, it's in the cherry genus, or prunus. Uh, this is prunus virginiana. There's a little bee on there. Uh, you can see again why it's so important. It's cold out, so he's not really moving too much. Um, he's taking his time. But it is a fantastic plant and a fantastic fruit. Um, it has so many uses. 
Uh, it's called Choke Cherry, not because you will choke if you eat it. Um, it's called Choke Cherry because when it is not fully, fully ripened, it is extremely astringent. So when you eat it right off the bush, uh, your mouth will instantly dry out. It's not very fun, but this is a really cool find. I'm really glad I found it. Um, as you can see, it is a woody species. So this one's pretty immature. It's not very tall. Um, but it's a cool plant. I really like choke cherry. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube right now, uh, you can go ahead and look up Weird Explorer or Weird Fruit Explorer. He does a big uh, uh, tour of native uh, fruits in uh, the eastern U.S. And choke cherry is one of them. And he shows exactly how to prepare it. Um, he makes a fruit or sort of a choke cherry aid out of it which is really cool, and he said it was delicious. So um, when this ripens, I'm probably gonna come back and see if I can do the same thing. Um, but it's a really, really cool plant, and it flowers in such a weird way as compared to some other uh, members of the cherry uh, genus. Um, has these really small flowers, uh, really uh, sort of um, kind of grape looking, and when the cherries start to ripen, they'll look a little bit like grapes. Um, that bee is still on there. Um, but it is a fantastic fruit. Um, I'm really looking forward to trying it this year. Um, what else about the choke cherry? Uh, oh, something that is interesting. Um, it, like every other member of the rose family, has a lot of cyanide in it. So the stems, the leaves, the flowers... Uh, the roots, the bark, the twigs, everything is chock full of cyanide. So uh, even within the fruit, the pit has a lot of cyanide, but that's common for seeds and plants throughout the rose family, including apples, including plums, apricots, cherries, pears. This is no different. It's just a little bit higher. So when you do prepare choke cherry, or if you do go foraging for it, um, and you are 100% sure that it is choke cherry, don't eat the seeds. You will get sick. Um, prepare it as you would any other potentially uh, dangerous substance. Uh, make sure that you do identify it fully, and when you do and it, you know that it is dangerous, you'll want to go ahead and uh, cook it. So when you do cook it, that not only gets rid of some of the astringency, it helps with uh, getting rid of some of that cyanide. Um, it's pretty easy to uh, cook it. It's really just putting it into water and boiling. But again, I'm really happy I found this. Uh, I've been looking for choke cherries for a while. Uh, maybe I'm just a bad uh, kind of uh, forager, but I haven't seen it. Uh, this is the first time I've seen it. Um, I've been to Moore Memorial Park quite a bit, and I've missed it a lot. Uh, but choke cherry, really, really cool plant, really useful, used by most indigenous cultures in the United States. Um, as a staple fruit crop. Um, as you can see from all the flowers, it produces a lot of fruit, so they had ample access to fruit throughout the year. Um, but yeah, choke cherry, a uh, really cool plant. So yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just really bad at finding plants. I, uh, not like 10 steps away, here's a full, full, uh, full, uh, choke cherry tree. Um, again, this one is not in full bloom, but, uh, it's kind of, uh, still kind of in bloom. Some of them are dying out, but um, again, choke cherries. This is going to have a ton of them. I'm going to come back when uh, they start to ripen. Um, just another little bit about this. Um, they uh, usually will turn kind of a bright red before they darken up a little bit more. Um, so if you are looking to eat them raw, which I don't really recommend because they probably won't taste very good, um, they are better when they are fully ripened and dark, not the red. And uh, if you eat them when they're yellow, you'll see why they're called choke cherry. They're especially astringent. So um, when this goes, uh, I'm not gonna pick all of them because I don't want to uh, decimate this plant. I will keep some uh, for the local wildlife. I will keep some for uh, seed dispersal. Um, I'm just one guy, I'm not gonna eat all of these choke cherries that come out. Um, so when you do forage and when you do look for native edible plants, uh, kind of use that rule, only take what you need. Um, 
really look up recipes if you're looking to do uh, some sort of native plant uh, edibility thing. Um, really, if you if something calls for just a cup of berries or choke cherries or whatever, just take that cup. Um, leave some for the next person or leave some for wildlife or leave some for mammals or birds or whatever. Um, but yeah, I am really surprised. I didn't know this was here. So uh, I'll be coming back and uh, keep an eye out for any potential videos that we put out about choke cherries moving forward, but I'm really happy. I, I'm really glad uh, that this is here. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a forest species uh, widespread throughout the eastern U.S., um, choke cherry. It's a really cool plant. Um, look up recipes if you're interested. Um, a lot of people aren't because, again, this is very astringent. Uh, don't expect it to taste anything like regular cherries that you get at the store. Um, it's related to them, but a uh, really, really different plant. Really different taste. But choke cherry. I'm really glad this is here. So here's another video about uh, one of the few trees that I know pretty well, uh, just based on the bark. So this is black cherry. Um, it is very closely related to the black cherries that you get in the grocery store. Uh, but here in Iowa, we can usually find these in woodlands. Um, you can tell that it is black cherry just from the bark. Uh, the way that I learned it is the bark uh, is very uh, sort of like crackly and shell-like. Um, kind of flaky and scaly, uh, and that's really how you tell that it is a black cherry. Uh, the other way to tell is looking up and seeing if you can find fruit, but uh, since the stretch is really, really high up in the air, I don't think we're going to see any flowers or fruit or anything. Um, but fruits are edible, uh, really used a lot by bees uh, and butterflies for pollen and nectar. Uh, right next to it is the hackberry that we already discussed, but um, black cherry. Uh, if you do see it and you do find fruits, uh, they are edible. Uh, they might not taste as good as you might find in the grocery store uh, with something that's uh, more uh, bred in it to be really delicious, but uh, still perfectly edible, uh, good wildlife food. Uh, but yeah, black cherry. On the ground here is one of my favorite butterflies. He's getting some sun. This is the morning cloak. Uh, it's a woodland species. Uh, it has that deep brown color uh, with a border of white. This guy's a little wet, it seems. It's been raining, uh, so he's probably trying to dry out his wings as best as he can. Um, but he also has really tiny spots of blue. Uh, this is in the same family as monarchs and other uh, sort of mottled shell uh, orange and black and brown butterflies called the Nymphalidae. Um, but these are one of my favorites. They're super cool looking. Uh, they're big. Um, they have those eye spots, which just makes them really cool. Um, I'll have to take a look to see what their host plants are, because I don't remember. Um, maybe mulberries, I'm not sure. But they are super cool. I really like these guys. Um, I'm going to get a picture of them and post it on a naturalist, just to prove to people that I know my butterflies. But uh, I do love them. They're super cool. So if you see one, uh, take a picture and send it over because they are awesome. So here's another topic that I want to talk about. So when you're walking through uh, the majority of the woods here in Iowa, especially upland, you'll randomly see a really large oak tree, just kind of out of nowhere. You can see the trunk is absolutely massive uh, and it just kind of stretches out and it's got really gnarled branches. Um, and really just outstretched limbs compared to the other trees that might be around here. Uh, say this ash tree right next door who's kind of uptight. Uh, everything's kind of stuck together. But this oak tree has taken up a lot of room and he's huge. So this is a good indicator of what things used to be like here uh, in this site. So this is how you tell apart a old growth plant from a new growth plant. Old growth with lots of stems and outstretched arms and things like that, and new growth, kind of up and pillar-like. So this goes to show me that when this tree was growing uh, from a sapling over 100 plus years, old tree, um, it had the room to actually stretch out its branches. It wasn't running into any other trees. Uh, it could really grow as large as it possibly could um, while stretching out his uh, 
arms and his limbs and his branches uh, and collecting all of that sunlight that he possibly could. This goes to show me that uh, none of these other trees were here. This probably was not a forest back in the day, uh, back before Moore Memorial Park was established. This was most likely a savanna. So underneath this tree, it would have been grassland. It wouldn't have been this underbrush or this undergrowth uh, woodland plants. There wouldn't have been hackberries or black cherries or anything like that. Uh, it would have been pretty much grassland, tall grass prairie underneath with a few large oaks spread out here and there. Um, over time though, uh, as we removed fire from the equation and as we removed uh, cat or bison from the equation that would keep everything down, uh, cut short, um, more woody plants like ashes and black cherries and hackberries and uh, even other oaks could start establishing themselves and really uh, take up the space that that prairie was in before. Um, so every once in a while you'll be walking in the woods, you'll be seeing pretty small kind of uh, upright trees kind of uh, not really stretching out really high and then you'll all of a sudden come come across a massive oak with really outstretched and kind of taking up a lot of space so um, that just is a good indicator to show you that uh, this was once a completely different ecosystem a couple hundred years ago uh, once this guy was fully established um, the land use changed around here uh, people started moving in uh, prairie was plowed up, farm fields were put in, farm fields were taken out, and parks were established with more trees and more forests. Um, this isn't to say that this is a bad forest or we should chop it down, it just means that this is not what was originally here. Um, it's just an interesting view into the past from one individual plant. Um, by taking a look at this massive oak, you can see and kind of take a look back in time to see what the conditions were like to start stretching out a lot of those branches or start stretching out a lot of those leaves or reach as high to the sun as it could. Um, and you can imagine what the undergrowth might have been like. Uh, think tall grass prairie again. But uh, again, really interesting finds that you see uh, when you're going through some of these new parks or new forests. Again, I was telling you, bees love water leaf and there is a queen bumblebee on that water leaf, uh, getting as much pollen and as much nectar as she possibly can. I'm not going into the forest because there's a ton of poison ivy, but um, yeah, if I can get a good angle. You can see she is going absolutely nuts over it. Um, not sure what species this is. I couldn't really get a good look uh, at her abdomen, which is how we usually tell. Pretty sure this is just a common eastern. Um, she's cleaning herself right now. Probably got some sticky stuff on her face or water or something, but um, yeah, she uh, she is loving it. Nope, not a common Easter. That's a that is a brown belted bumblebee. I haven't seen one this year. Uh, she flew. She's somewhere. I don't know where she went. But uh, Bombus griseicolis. Uh, haven't seen one this year. They're not rare. Uh, just haven't stumbled across one. They're usually the ones that people mistake for. Uh, rusty patch bumblebees because uh, that brown belt looks like a rusty patch um, but the brown belt is bordered by black while the rusty patch is completely surrounded with yellow but again she is going absolutely nuts for the water leaf uh, produces a lot of nectar and, and pollen so she is having a treat today a short little tidbit um, I had talked about Virginia water leaf before uh, but I never went into why it's called water leaf. Uh, this isn't going to be a really large section of a video. Um, it's really because of the leaves. So the leaves kind of look like they were splashed with water. So you have that contrast between the dark green and the light green. The light green looks like an area that was uh, sort of puddled with water, while the dark green looks a little drier. But yeah, that's where the name comes from. So here's a very non-traditional uh, invasive species. Uh, this is common hops, the stuff you find in beer. I found this last year when it was blooming, and I mean, it smells nice, but not supposed to be here. I don't even know how it got here. I mean, we're in the middle of prairie right now, uh, between prairie and a sidewalk, and I don't know how the hell the hops got here, but it is kind of taken over quite a bit. Um, I think I think it flowers later in the summer, but uh, it's perfectly good hops if you're looking to make beer. Uh, the southern edge of the prairie uh, at Moore Memorial, if you're if you're interested in beer making, but yeah, hops just out of out of nowhere. 
Um, this is the stuff you find on trellises growing vertically, but obviously we don't have those, so it just kind of makes gross little shrubs and takes over an area. But yeah, hops, who knew?